Um, it is my. Um, excuse me. Apologies to everyone online for that. Uh, welcome everybody, and it's uh, my pleasure to welcome you to the uh, Research and Technology Forum, uh, engineered by Corning, designed by Syracuse Architecture, the architectural applications of Corning Willow Glass, and I appreciate everyone coming in today on this spring-like day here in Syracuse, and uh, thank you for everybody who is online as well. Um, I want to thank Ed and, and Tammy and Carrie for hosting us at COE today. Uh, it's great to be part of this research and, and technology forum. <clears throat> um, today we're going to hear about the culmination of a semester-long project between Corning and the Syracuse Architecture Department. Um, and I remember back in June of last year in 2018 when uh, Sean and, and Daquan um, started this conversation. It was actually here uh, in the Center uh, of Excellence uh, in a conference room not far from here and begun to discuss what we could do and what the research around um, architecture could bring to a company like Corning. So very excited to be here today and very excited to hear kind of some of the outcomes of the, of the class. Um, joining me today is going to be Dr. Daquan Park, the Assistant Professor for uh, School uh, for Architecture and a Faculty Research Fellow here at the Center of Excellence, and Dr. Sean Garner, the Res Research Associate at Corning Research in Sullivan Park. Um, in a minute, I'm going to ask Dr. Garner to come up, but just a few words about his background. Uh, Sean is a Senior Research Associate at Corning Incorporated. He received his engineering degree from Stevens Institute and his PhD uh, from uh, USC in electrophysics. Um, Dr. Garner has 25 patents to his name and has authored or co-authored uh, 200, over 200 articles and presentations throughout his career. Um, and so I'd like to ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Sean Garner to the podium. Yeah, as mentioned, I'm uh, Sean Garner at the, the Research Center at Corning. And today I'll give uh, an overview of uh, Corning's flexible glass activities. Uh, and then Daquan will give a description of how uh, him and his students uh, use the glass uh, as, uh, as part of a design program. Um, so if uh, you want more information about Corning in general, Corning research in general, just let me know and I'd be happy to talk uh, afterwards uh, about that uh, in more general terms. Um, so I'll give a very quick description of flexible glass, uh, different applications, just examples of applications that, that we've been pursuing uh, with the glass, uh, and then Daquan will give more of a specialized uh, focus uh, uh, description of some architecture applications. And then also I'll talk about uh, different ways of making devices or, or, or processing uh, uh, films or features on the glass, uh, specifically in roll-to-roll -roll processing, and then give a, a quick summary. So this is going to be just a, a quick uh, overview. So, so as background, uh, flexible glass really enables a revolutionary uh, scaling of size uh, opportunity uh, in devices or, or, or applications that, that utilize glass. And so as background, uh, glass is formed in a continuous manner. Uh, let's say molten glass is, is fed into a, a, a draw process. And if the glass were for uh, sheets or substrates for liquid crystal displays or OLED displays, uh, these sheets uh, would be cut at regular intervals at the bottom of the draw. And there, in this case, the glass might be uh, something like uh, 0.5 millimeters thick. Uh, and making sheets of glass in that manner uh, started out uh, where the glass was uh, about uh, 100 micron or 100 millimeter by 100 millimeter on side. And then now it is made over three meters by three meters, so over like 10 square meters in glass sheets that are about a half a millimeter thick. But by, uh, by forming, by pulling the glass so it's thinner, uh, and then putting a winding unit at the bottom of the draw, similar to polymer film, how polymer film or metal foil or paper are wound, uh, the glasses could be actually be, be made continuously and then wound onto a spool. So as an example, uh, this, this is a spool of glass, uh, 100 micron thickness. Uh, the width is 1.3 meters, and 300 meter length is being wound onto the spool. And that's just an arbitrary length, uh, just how much glass length until the, the spool fills up. Uh, the, the glass could be cut into uh, coupons or wafers or sheets, 
uh, could be temporarily bonded to a processing carrier, or uh, my, my interest is really uh, using the glass uh, in roll-to-roll uh, -roll processing for continuous manufacturing of, of devices or applications. So I kind of put that into scale. It, this is the, the 10 square meters of glass sheets, um, but in, in one big step change, all of a sudden there's uh, 300, uh, 300 square meters of, of glass on the spool. Um, so right away there's, there's an interest of really uh, building the whole ecosystem of, of not just uh, the glass by itself, but, but really encouraging new applications of what does the glass enable that's not possible or practical to achieve with other materials, like polymer film or rigid glass substrates. And what does a 300 square meter uh, area of, of thin flexible glass really enable in terms of new applications that, that people really haven't uh, uh, conceived or really pursued before? And then that's my interest at the Research Center at Corning uh, and then interacting with different universities, national labs, or, or other companies and, and groups like, like the Quantum's group uh, to really identify what are new opportunities that, that really people didn't even uh, conceptualize before. Uh, and, then, and then work with them to, uh, to, to do proof of concept uh, demonstrations. So just uh, rough uh, uh, properties uh, in glass. Uh, and this is a, a thick, a three millimeter thick soda line glass, typical used for windows. Uh, and this is 100 micron thick glass, and both of them have ITO coating on it. Uh, you can see, besides being thin, lightweight, and then I'll, I'll describe uh, also flexible or, or, or bendable, um, the, there's other, other effects like parallel optical effects seen as the glass gets thinner. So, for example, there's uh, a shifting in the optical image, a parallax in the thicker glass, which is much, much less in the thinner glass because there's less optical material that, that the glass goes through. So comparing uh, the thin glass to either uh, a thicker glass or, or polymer film, which is typically used for flexible electronics, uh, there's, uh, there's advantages for the glass in terms of optical quality, uh, surface quality. The, the surface roughness of the glass is less than 0.5 nanometers. Uh, thermal capability, uh, devices have been made on the glass over 600 degrees C uh, to really enable a, a wide range of device fabrication. Uh, dimensionally stable, uh, chemical compatible with different processing conditions, uh, and then really her hermetic. Even, even though glass gets thinner and thinner, it's still the benchmark for hermeticity. Um, it, it's whenever we try to measure water vapor transmission through the glass, we're always limited by the, uh, the detection limit of the system being, being used. So this is uh, just showing uh, the optical transmission of the glass at, at different thicknesses. Uh, 630 microns is typical for uh, a display substrate, and then 100 microns or, or below is more flexible. You can see that the, the optical uh, transmission is really independent of the thickness, uh, really indicating that there's minimal uh, haze or scattering or absorption in this thickness of glass. It's really the, uh, the optical loss is just due to the, the surface reflection. Uh, and then when you get to the UV, uh, that UV cutoff is really thickness dependent. So different applications might utilize different thicknesses of glass. And also the glass has different uh, like Young's modulus and hardness compared to polymer films, uh, but then also stainless steel. And uh, this is just a, a quick uh, summary of properties, but uh, this, this uh, a book referenced here uh, really goes into a lot more detail in terms of uh, properties of flexible glass, mechanical reliability, different applications and different processing conditions or device fabrication methods. So just uh, highlighting uh, applications just and again, these are just examples to kind of give uh, more more inspiration or kind of kind of generate some thought into what might be possible, but but by no means is a kind of the all inclusive list. So the, the glass could be uh, laminated to different materials, either either uh, metal backers or polymer sheets um, or wood um, for really interior architecture purposes. And, and this is uh, the, the concept that uh, we originally showed up uh, here at Syracuse a year and a half ago and uh, Declan was interested in expanding this a little bit more than just flat surfaces for interior architecture. Um, but really the, the glass could be laminated and then decorated either like a variety of different digital images could be printed on the back of the glass uh, so, so it looks like uh, like marble or wood uh, or, or different different types of stone, uh, really for uh, vertical surfaces, uh, whiteboards, uh, hospital walls are they're interested in those applications because it could really be cleaned. Uh, but that that hints at one application. Uh, another application is 
uh, OLED lighting. Um, so for that, uh, OLED lighting uh, really values the, the hermeticity of the glass, uh, the glass being able to be bent, uh, optical quality, uh, really because it helps uh, distinguish OLED lighting uh, as a distributed uh, light source, like a surface emitter. It really helps distinguish OLED lighting from LED lighting, which is going to be more of a, a point source. Um, so this is uh, other applications being pursued uh, for, for flexible glass. Uh, mentioned I'll, I'll, real briefly that uh, like photovoltaics, a wide variety of uh, solar energy or photovoltaic devices are being uh, considered. Um, this, this really highlights the ability of the optical quality, hermeticity, and the ability to do roll-to-roll -roll processing on the glass to really generate a large area of uh, photovoltaics and, and a solution-based process. Uh, to really uh, drive down the cost of, of uh, photovoltaic uh, panels. And then another uh, I mean, just topic is different types of transparent devices, uh, where this is an example of a transparent antenna made out of a transparent conductor on, on top of glass uh, that could that be integrated into like a window um, to, to take advantage of the large areas of, of windows that, that exist that really start integrating electronic functionality into windows or other types of surfaces. So again, these are just examples of different applications, um, but different, uh, different things are also possible and, and more than, more than uh, interested in talking with uh, different people if, uh, if different applications or thoughts that might, might come to mind of, of just trying different things. And as pointed out, the, uh, the glass is really uh, suitable for roll-to-roll -roll processing. In my view uh, is that uh, different types of processes are, are completely possible in, on flexible glass in a roll-to-roll -roll process. It really comes down to uh, what is the application, uh, what, what, is, what device is really being required to be manufactured uh, in that case, and then what, what process is required, uh, and then uh, a roll-to-roll -roll or roller-based conveyance system uh, could be designed to accomplish that, that task. So just as examples of more uh, research or early development interactions that we've had, uh, we've demonstrated the ability to do roll-to-roll uh, -roll lamination of, of uh, flexible glass with polymer film, uh, laser uh, ablation patterning of ITO on the flexible glass, uh, gravure offset printing showing that we can print uh, transparent uh, metal mesh structures uh, with uh, line widths of about 10 microns, uh, vacuum deposition of a variety of different films. So this is the flexible glass going into the, the coating system, and this is uh, after the chamber's open, this is the, uh, um, the, the, the web that's been coated with nice shiny metal kind of coming out, out of the system. So you can really, can really create uh, large area, high quality mirrors on, on 300 meter um, square meters of, of glass. And this different types of solution coating is possible and different types of roll-to-roll I mean, -roll photography is also possible. So these are just uh, kind of more research uh, interactions that we've had. Uh, ITRI is uh, the research lab in Taiwan. Uh, CAM is uh, the Binghamton University uh, manufacturing roll-to-roll -roll, uh, center uh, there that we do a considerable collaborations with. Uh, Frontier is a slot die coating uh, equipment vendor in uh, Tawanda, Pennsylvania. Um, and then we have a few more examples of, of taking a step further of, of not just a research lab or small scale interactions, uh, but really working with the overall uh, other, other equipment vendors or other uh, more commercial partners um, to, to really identify or, or encourage the whole ecosystem to building uh, building up. So it's not, not enough for, for the flexible glass to exist. I mean, that doesn't uh, really make the business opportunity by itself. You need a whole ecosystem. You need equipment that can handle the glass, that can build devices on it. You need other materials that are compatible with the flexible glass. Uh, and also you need uh, applications and device designs that really value the glass. Because if you're if you're just building the same devices on polymer film I mean, that exists right now on polymer film or, or thick rigid glass, but just building the same devices on 100 micron thick glass, it really doesn't drive a, drive a need or identify the value of the flexible glass. It's really, really working with these partners or other collaborators, really trying to identify what can this glass enable that, that doesn't exist before. Um, so just as an example um, of different types of, of processes, uh, we've worked with applied materials uh, to, to show that the glass at one meter wide um, can be conveyed through roller systems that, that simulate a, a uh, fabrication process. Uh, so this is glass being unwound with the interleaf. Uh, it's, being, it's going over a roller system. You can see it's nice and flat with no 
uh, no um, uh, deviation um, or wrinkling. Uh, the glass could be wound up again on a spool without interleaf, and then we can wind it, unwind it uh, multiple times at, at conditions uh, typical of a, of, a, of a fabrication process uh, that they have. Uh, as another example, uh, we worked with a different group on microapplication of uh, surface features. Uh, so in this case, uh, or just a description of microapplication, uh, this is uh, the glass web going into the system. And then there, a UV curable acrylate is, is applied uh, between the glass and uh, a pattern drum. So the drum has a surface pattern into it. Um, so when the, the coat of glass uh, comes in contact with the drum, uh, the, the, the pattern in the drum molds the, the UV curable acrylate, uh, and then the UV light cures it. Uh, and then when the glass is released from the drum, it has this imprinted pattern uh, embossed in that UV curable material. Um, so that, that happens uh, with polymer film. Um, right now, but the difference is the glass uh, really has high, uh, high optical transmission in the UV uh, and low scattering, um, and then very dimensionally stable. Um, so it enables uh, fabrication of uh, prism structures, uh, diffusers, lenticulars, uh, not just on one side of the glass, but on, on both sides in a way that those features could be registered to each other, uh, or the, the features on the glass could then be registered to other devices are aligned very accurately to other other device or uh, other objects in the system. Another example is working with uh, von Arden uh, and then Fraunhofer to demonstrate a uh, vacuum deposition of uh, transparent conductor ITO uh, at higher temperature. So this shows a glass spool 100 meter length of uh, ITO being deposited uh, in a continuous manner uh, and then really targeting uh, uh, OLED lighting or photovoltaic uh, uh, sheet resistance values. Yeah. And then as a, a final example, just of uh, the use of glass or the capability of glass in, in roll to roll systems and really uh, like manufacturing equipment or manufacturing systems, uh, we also collaborated with Kodak uh, and, and ran uh, the flexible glass web through one of the systems that they have uh, located in Rochester. Uh, so in this system, the glass, it's a 60 meter overall path length from unwind to rewind. Uh, the web is unwound uh, in this section here. Uh, it could either be printed or, or, or solution coated, and then it goes through a drying oven, uh, and then it's wound back up. Um, so by, by uh, running glass through there, we demonstrated the ability to run the glass, just convey the glass over 30 rollers in the overall system at about 30 meters per minute, so more at manufacturing speeds. Uh, we then did printing uh, features of, uh, of less than 80 microns. So it really wasn't uh, optimized in terms of the feature dimensions. Um, but you can see that the, the pattern is that with the ink is here and the glass is uh, coming off at a 45 degree angle here uh, after the, the printing has occurred. And it really, um, this also indicates that it's difficult to take pictures of the 100 micron. It, it looks like uh, trying to take a picture of a 100 micron thick window. So it's, it doesn't really show up too well in the, in the photos. Um, but the glass can be run through the system and printed or this is a slot that coating of, uh, of a black ink uh, before it gets run through the, the coating system. Um, so either printing or slot die coating was done at slower speeds. Uh, that was just because of uh, the ink chosen, just the, the solvent and ink need differently, needed longer residence time in the drying oven. Um, so the glass could definitely be conveyed faster. It was just uh, the ink drying was, was really limiting the, the ink or the, the conveyance. This is more of the, the action photo of, of here in the printing station uh, glass being conveyed after being printed uh, with a flexible printer and then a, a different ink um, after the glass is being uh, dried uh, and then wound up. It, it's, there's a dancer roller here. Uh, so this is the glass web being wound around the dancer roller uh, to control the tension before being wound up on the spool. So again, this is, indicates another uh, process option uh, that, that we've demonstrated. So again, a variety of different uh, uh, processes are possible on the glass. Uh, some uh, some equipment that we've run the glass through have been uh, specifically designed to handle flexible glass. Um, other systems, like the system at Kodak, where when that when that tool was 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 built and designed, they had really uh, no expectation that Corning would show up one day wanting to run uh, glass through the system, and, and that worked uh, through minor modifications also. Um, so it's again a variety of different processes are possible. It really comes down to what the application needs are. Uh, and then that's what uh, Daquan will talk about uh, next is, is kind of in applications that could value or make use of the flexible glass, uh, really uh, highlighting different uh, different properties of the glass to, 
to enable different different structures. So just a, a quick summary. Um, really, the glass has uh, advantages uh, in terms of optical properties, dimensional properties, temperature, hermeticity, uh, specifically compared to polymer film. Uh, we, we've uh, demonstrated the mechanical reliability of the glass. It's, it's really following an approach that the Corning's use for uh, making high reliability uh, optical fiber, glass optical fiber. It's formed the glass with high initial strength and minimized uh, creation of defects, managed stress, stresses, and then really really optimize the, the overall solution for reliability based on the application needs. Uh, and then um, we're really, really promoting and working with other groups uh, externally uh, to really establish the overall ecosystem that, that can then receive in the glass and have applications uh, in mind or have equipment processes in mind that, that could actually use the glass uh, to enable um, not, not just research evaluations, but actual manufacturing on, on the glass objects. So that's, that's a quick summary of the, the glass, and I'm happy to talk more about it afterwards, but I think Daquan will, will talk next. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Sean. It's always impressive to see the innovation capacity at Corning, and uh, we really appreciate you giving us a inside look into some of the amazing work at Corning and, and how you're once again redefining how we think of glass. So thank you for that. Um, and I think you also saw in that presentation a bit about how collaborative Corning is as well and how they're working with various partners and others in the ecosystem to try to develop the marketplace around the uses for willow glass. And with, with that transition, we're gonna turn it over to Daquan Park um, Dr. Park is um, here at the Syracuse School of Architecture and the Center of Excellence. He received his Master's of Architecture uh, from the University of Illinois and his Master's in Doctor of Design from Harvard and has done extensive work um, at MIT um, and the Weiss Institute of Research as well on applications and research within architecture. Um, his research uh, focuses on the practice and teaching of architecture and how it intersects with design and material technology and the environmental science. He's also director of the Matter Lab here at the Syracuse COE, and it's been a pleasure to get to work with Dr. Park. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you for the introduction. This works, right? So uh, before I start, so a little bit more about the background. So, so the students uh, who are working on this are uh, Master of Science students at the School of Architecture. So they are here to learn about research, but their, their background is really architecture and design, architectural design. So, it was about really developing application using sort of the state of the art uh, technology, but for them or for us, it was really trying to teach students how to do research, it's really different. So just before we start, just, just in terms of difference between architectural design and material research, uh, there's many things, but the fundamental difference that the students really struggle in when I was transitioning from an architect to a researcher was, okay, architects are trained as a generalist. We tend to do top-down. So if you see master plan, you see overall massing, and then you start, you, you try to create some sort of a vision or, or, or concept and then try to fit everything into that, that box. Whereas material research is more on, from the bottom up, so you really go step by step, it's more linear, and then you sort of start from the characteristics of a material and properties, and then you build up to something. So that was very, very difficult for the students to get used to. And also, uh, design is non-linear, whereas research is linear. So, so students or, or architects designers tend to jump around or almost circular where we already have a result or we have some sort of a vision there and then we try to fit everything all the variables towards that so we so it was very difficult for me to convince the students you don't have if you already know what you're going to do this is not really research 
So that was sort of the, the fundamental challenge from the students. So the process we took as a course, it was a three, seven, three month uh, directed research. There were five students and five projects. And I'm gonna show uh, four of them. And uh, the, the process is uh, customized for students to sort of change that paradigm shift from designer to researcher. So the first step is the same, general research and case study. But because we're approaching it as a as sort of a broad thing, we're not just focusing on one technology. The initial start was really having Corning come in, Sean come in, and then talk about a broad range of technologies available or products available from Corning. And naturally, students really went for Willow Glass, and, and that was, this was the result. So even within Willow Glass, even within the, the, the broad field of glass, the goal, were, goal of this initial phase was, okay, you need to focus on something, whatever it is, do a broad research on glass, do a broad research on technology, all these things, but really try to define some sort of a topic that each student are, are interested in. So as an example, Harshita uh, looked at a lot of adaptive facades, dynamic kinetic facades. So her keyword was movement. So, okay, willow glass, you can flex it, it moves in a certain way. How do you really use, utilize that in architecture? Uh, Wang was interested in space, particularly office spaces. And, and this flexible spaces, the discourse uh, of open space versus open office versus closed office, that kind of thing. And then uh, Shio was interested in layers. So if you layer glass, what type of effects you can create. Uh, Lei was interested more about the physical attributes of, of glass, like patterns and forming and things like that. So these were the initial uh, starting points for the students. And then, I need to see the time. There's a lot of slides and so uh, the third one was, okay, this, at this point, I asked the students to do blind production. So based on those topics, you need to just produce something. So sketches, renderings, uh, prototypes, all these things, just focusing on the inspirations they took from the case studies and the research they did. The students really struggled at this stage because they weren't really, they didn't really know what they're doing. They're just producing things. So Harshita, based on the movement, she started cutting out various patterns on paper and trying to open clothes and these things. One started using that ribbon, flexible ribbon, ribbon uh, sheet of paper and, and started creating different spaces. Chengxi uh, created layers out of transparent materials and, and started putting on light, shades, all these things. And they printed uh, different patterns or textures on a uh, transparent substrate and started manipulating it. So the next four app from these uh, blind productions, this, I asked the students to identify a niche or something compelling about the broad range of of prototypes they produced. And, and, and it, it went on for around two weeks. So they put in quite a lot of uh, production work. So from then, each student developed a, a small sort of a, uh, idea from that. So, so Harshita was interested in, okay, if we add a, a simple mechanism in there, you can really put a cutout, you can also make a very simple system. Uh, Wang was interested in the in the rotoral process, actual rotoral process, not, not in the scientific way, but okay. That's really interesting that you can roll a limited amount of, or produce a limited amount of glass from that. So what if you can actually rotate that 90 degrees and use it as sort of a rolling uh, panel that you can use as, as identifying spaces. And then Chen Xi, started printing different layers on, on, uh, on transparent materials and then started actuating it to create different effects. 
uh, they went towards more of an artistic or creative type of uh, approach where he actually found a willow tree and then looked at it and he wanted to emulate this movement and, and, and features in, in some sort of a designed pavilion or something like that. So that was their, their next. So from that, the student went through uh, several rounds of iterations. So the, the initial prototype they developed, and then from that, about three times, these were the, the latest uh, the iteration. So Harshita in started introducing uh, magnetic strips. So then when you go, you see how uh, it snaps. Uh, this is sort of a physical model of that, that adaptable space, which uh, the rolling or the sliding uh, flexible glass. Uh, Chengxi created that mechanical device, sort of representing a window and, and creating all these different types of shading or, or reflection system. And then uh, Lay's, the last one is uh, Lay's pavilion of the scale model. And I'll show you animation that how, how it moves later on. So the students, it's their first uh, research project or material research work, so it's not really we, we didn't have a chance to go really deep into the functionality or scientific way, but I feel like these are quite interesting as a, as a design project as well as a start of, a, of an interesting research projects. The last stage is speculation, so having them put on their architect uh, hat again and then just speculate on, on what, what it feels like or what it's, what it's going to be in this type of uh, environment. So in terms of Corning's feedback, uh, the, the first stage was early on. Chung came in, described all the, the backgrounds of all the, the technologies of Corning and research activities of Corning. And then the student went through three steps. And then after they identified their first niche or, or compelling area, we got a feedback. And then after several iterations, we did another feedback. And then lastly, the final review was taking place both at Swab Architecture once and then at Corning Headquarters again after it. So I'll quickly show you uh, the, the projects and you'll see how the students progress their, their project from start to end. And I'll try to go fairly quickly. So this is Harshita's work, if you remember, it's the opening, redefining the openings. So she looked at fenestration and architecture, a lot of adaptive kinetic facades, and then just getting a piece of paper, starting to deform it and, and creating different movements out of it. And the different ways to actuate it. These were very early studies. And then different patterns, like kirigami, origami inspired patterns, and how do you use these patterns to do different, different types of movements and openings. And then she ended up going back to her initial idea of the simple flat type geometry that just opens up like that and started developing it into an actual uh, product, right? So this is her early stage, just this piece of uh, plastic sheet cut and then wiring it and then just putting it open and close. And this was the detail of our, our final prototype. So this was iteration one with multiple openings. And then she started introducing magnetic strips so that shuts properly, and then carrying that through the entire opening and open and close. So this was very interesting to the students as well, because before we were, students were doing building, so we never do a lot of scale. But in this type of material study, they have to do a, try to do sort of a working prototyping one-to-one -one scale, which is quite difficult. 
So our or architectural models are more representative, so it's like wood model or paper models. Whereas this one, we're asking them to use materials that are either the right, the exact material or very, very similar material. And then speculations. And in this stage, we're not really concerned about, there's all sorts of problems you see when you look at these renderings, but it's really about trying to trigger the, the inspirations and what can you do with this and, and things like that. So, and so what type of rolling blinds, openings. Then even controlling water or wind flow of buildings. Like that. The second one is uh, Wang's project where he's looking at flexible uh, office space. So this was his initial model. It's just, just a simple ribbon, ribbon, uh, ribbon geometry and, and defining spaces. So he, he did a bunch of studies creating different types of of spaces and working with furniture layout to create different zones like learn, collaborate, socialize, focus. And then that that uh, idea about using this role, maybe probably make it longer, but and then using that as some sort of a flexible room divider. So that, this was the vision he had. Some, there's a role of, of glass we look glass in the center of the room and then you start pulling it out and some portions are projections, some portions are lighting, some portions are media wall, sensors, all these kind of things. And then in order to accommodate the, the, the structure, we envision this type of ceiling device, like a track device that can create different shape, different geometry of spaces. So for example, this type of pattern could have these, the, all these types of spaces within the track. So each pattern creates different types of spaces. And then starting to put in uh, furniture and starting to see the layout, what type of area. So at the end, we chose this one, the large circle with four intersecting circles. And these are the spaces that can be created using that, that, that track system. And then envisioning the interactions and what type of space you can use. And then speculating on the technologies that, that can be built in like touch sensors and, and uh, OLED and, and media, like media elements and stuff like that. And then actually, detailing it out to be somewhat realistic and implementable. So this was a physical model, scaled model, and then some speculative uh, renderings. Chengxi's project was about layers. So these were the initial tests. He created it, tried to create shadows, tried to put it in light and, and what type of effects you create with those. And then transitioning to creating patterns um, and then shifting those layers and creating different effects. So even at this stage, he really doesn't know what to do with what he's trying to do. But because that one rotates, that one, he pinches it and moves it up and down, just creating different effects. And then he starts researching patterns and trying to say like, okay, if you have a certain pattern and certain movement creates different zones of, of uh, transparency within the same same plane. So that area, the middle section is more opaque than the edge, whereas this one is the opposite where the edges become more opaque and the center becomes transparent. 
And it's really about how you shift the layers and move the layers. And then we're looking at the pattern itself and trying to identify what type of pattern works for what type of motion. And, and looking at the effects. And then this one, trying to be as transparent as possible and opaque as possible. So what type of geometry works with that the best? And then introducing different movements, looking at the shading, maybe even using it as a light shelf that reflects light deep into the space. And after many different types of uh, studies, iterations, came up with this uh, prototype where, okay, trying to accommodate all the motions and patterns that he developed. These are the details of it and the effect that he envisions. So the final one, which Lay's work is more in towards, uh, uh, in, in architecture, there's a, there's a research method called uh, research pavilion. So we, we research on materials and try to create this uh, provocative pavilion. It doesn't really have a function. It's it's this architectural scale thing that really highlights the feature of a material. So he approached the research as that. So he wanted to create a pavilion using the, the flexibility of willow glass or, or the attributes of willow glass. So the initial step, he just printed on, on a transparent substrate and, and started bending it. He also with, with patterns, printed patterns, and then deformed it. And then he also worked with forming. So even within the same uh, material, if you start creating these, these undulated forms, it reinforces the structure. So when you bend it, it's reinforced in a specific way. So it's easier to move in a certain direction. So he created these uh, different patterns and fabricated it and tested it. So even at this point, he doesn't really know what he's doing. He's just trying to create as much effect and, and, and researching what type of physical things that can happen with the glass. So using these methods and, and this concept of the willow glass, you know, the name after he came from willow tree, he created uh, this, this pavilion, so that's, you can see some sort of a willow tree like geometry forming the, the layers of glass and cutouts with some sort of a pattern going in the middle to accentuate that, that geometry. So he chose a Corning Glass Museum as a site, right there. That's the site plan and elevations. So it's the layers of, of willow glass cut in a specific way. And then these are the patterns that are formed onto the glass. These are the glass layer, that's the structure. So you can see that the upper portion of each fins have this uh, rib shape so that the, the motion is controlled in a way. And then towards the bottom, it gets flat, so it's really flexible. And then you have these patterns printed. So you can see that this one, it has a rib there, so it really bends like that, whereas the other one just, the whole thing just bends. So he's trying to, trying to emulate the, the movement of the willow tree by constraining it a little bit. So that's the, the perspective. And this is the, the final physical model just showing the wind. It's a small model. So this was the process we took. We're, and as, as architects, so the students and myself are not scientists. So, so we're not trying to 
hope for really like a like innovative new technology. I mean, we're really looking at this, trying to create ideas about how do we use it, what type of interesting things that we can create. And uh, this, I feel like, is a starting starting point for something like a phono model, where, okay, the, the, the famous phono model in, in research, where you have a lot of ideas at the bottom, and then maybe a couple of them go to the next step, and then the final is maybe you, you it becomes a platform technology or, or something like that. So for, for us, this was more of a three month of building this 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 bottom fundamental of the phono model. And I hope uh, we can I can continue with coding on on uh, either generating new ideas and also maybe some of them could push to the next level. Some of the research is done and move to the next stages. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Daquan. I, it's, uh, it's, it's fascinating um, for us to, to sit here and see some of these applications and, and congratulations to you and your students on such amazing work. Um, at this point, we want to open it up to some questions and to see if, if there's any folks in the room that have specific questions or follow-up items. And we also have folks online, too. And um, Carrie, you'll let us know if there's any um, questions emerging from, from the audience. So at this point, any? They, they want hands but get back up there. Yeah, why don't we bring you guys both back up? <laughs> Excellent. Here we go. Question? The question for Scott, probably. Um, you talked about this very, very strong stuff. My mind is Sean. If you point to me, I'll answer yes. it. <laughs> so you talked about a very, very thin sheet. How do you weld? Is there a seamless welding process if I, if I want to? not use a flat sheet, but I want to bring a sheet like a cylinder, for example, right. or any other shape, or merge two different shapes. Is that a process? Yeah, basically how, how the question is how to bond uh, yeah. two sheets of glass together. And uh, yeah, there's a variety of different ways depending on really what the overall requirements are. Uh, so there could be uh, on, on the most uh, kind of uh, like hermetic sealing could be glass to glass bonding or using a glass frit. Uh, there could be UV curable adhesives, uh, some pressure sensitive adhesives, um, metal to metal bonding, like solder bonding. Um, so there's different methods that, that could be used. It's, it really depends on what the overall kind of requirement set is. The, the reason I asked that question is I was looking at your cup. So I had an idea. Have you looked at the inside of your coffee mug? After I've used it for yeah. like two months or so, yeah. <laughs> it becomes black on the inside. Yeah, so right. I was thinking that is because your ceramic is much more porous. Mm -hmm. So the size of the molecules in coffee are so small, even though they're colored, they actually pass through. Right, so right. You have a dark meaning of that. So I was thinking, why don't we have this glass because it is so thin mm -hmm. without adding a lot of amount of weight? Add something completely inside that will not allow those molecules to pass through. Right. You don't have being your back then. Right. So this is the type of thing I was thinking. I, I, I just looked at it. How do we bring that? Because there is a cylinder, mm -hmm. and then there is a circular plate of bottom. You have to have something that actually works without creating a huge seam. You don't want to have something over that because now the small molecules can be used. Okay. Yeah. So that's as compared to flat sheets. Right. Yeah, there's, uh, so yeah, it may be different in for, for coffee mug, there might be, and just other, other mugs could be just molded out of glass. Or, or, so there might be other ways of achieving similar things. Um, but if it's overall topic of, of how to how to bond um, either glass objects or glass sheets together, um, and there's different variations, and some use for like window architecture application now for bonding or laminating glass to glass yeah. uh, with the intermediate ceiling. 
um, the, there's other applications where uh, more for like uh, displays or electronics uh, use other types of uh, sealing epoxy for liquid crystal displays or more hermetic sealing uh, for photovoltaic or, or OLED displays um, so again there might be different methods but but really depends on what the overall requirements are there, there's let's say multiple tools to, to use or different approaches based on what needs to happen I got a question. What's the difference between Gorilla Glass and Gorilla Glass? Yeah. yeah, so the Gorilla Glass is really meant to be a mechanical, uh, durable cover for electronic, uh, like smartphones or, or, or tablets. Um, so it's, it's really designed to retain uh, mechanical reliability after abrasion or after defects occur. Uh, the Willow Glass uh, originally started uh, to be used as a substrate that devices can be built on. Uh, so not necessarily intending to be a durable cover. Uh, so Gorilla Glass is ion exchanged uh, to, to chemically strengthen it, uh, to create a compressive stress layer at the surface. Uh, where the, the Willow Glass, uh, similar to other types of uh, uh, substrate glasses, device <coughs> substrate glasses that according cells for liquid crystal displays or OLED displays, it was really meant to be have a composition that is uh, alkali free uh, and high temperature uh, to really be compatible with the device fabrication process. Um, so that, that's kind of where the composition and the, the intention uh, came from. Another question is what's the minimum bending radius that this willow glass can get? Yeah, so for the, the, the glass that uh, I have really uh, described here and I've been working with, uh, it was really, um, really intended to be. Uh, targeting uh, thin, lightweight, and roll-to-roll uh, -roll application, device applications, and then also roll-to-roll -roll processing. Uh, so for the 100 micron thick glass, uh, just as an example, uh, we've been doing uh, the roll-to-roll -roll processing uh, at, at Binghamton University has uh, rollers, uh, all their roll-to-roll -roll equipment has uh, six inch diameter rollers. So that, that's a, an example uh, bed radius, like 100 millimeter or 75 millimeter radius is kind of a, a, a typical uh, radius for, for the 100 micron thick glass that, that I've been working with. So it's really targeting uh, thin devices, lightweight devices, or maybe applications that have uh, a large bending, like conformal, like uh, building a display or, or photovoltaic or, 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 or features, and then wrapping around a column in a building or, or some curved structure or, or uh, a, a coated mirror, like a high reflectivity mirror and being used for, uh, let's say, concentrated solar power as a, as a, a curved reflector uh, for sunlight. So it's really larger scale radius. If it's repeatedly flexed, will it break? So the, uh, the question is more about um, like reliability and fatigue. Uh, so, so the glass, uh, for glass, it's uh, a, a dynamic fatigue of repeated bending uh, is uh, is not not a, a, the major concern. It's more of a static fatigue, uh, where it's bent at a, a, a bend radius set that creates high stress, and then over time uh, the the defects and, and water and stress kind of combine to uh, to propagate fractures. Um, but dynamic fatigue uh, is not a is not a, a significant uh, concern for the glass. But as an example. Um, we, uh, we interacted with NREL to build uh, cadmium telluride uh, devices, uh, photovoltaic devices on the glass. And they wanted to understand uh, how the glass behaves uh, for uh, flexible uh, PV. Uh, so they deposited a variety of different uh, transparent conductors on the glass uh, and then bent it uh, 25,000 cycles uh, at about an inch, uh, like 25 or 30 millimeter radius. Um, and, and the glass uh, survived 25,000 cycles. Um, the uh, transparent conductor on the glass uh, survived without increasing uh, resistance values. Um, so it really, really comes down to what uh, managing uh, defects, uh, understanding what's the distribution <coughs> of defects in the glass, uh, managing or understanding stresses that the glass is going to be experiencing, uh, and then uh, basing uh, kind of the, reliable, the overall solution for reliability on, on, on the situation. Oh, this question. Uh, incorporated into, say, uh, a, a concrete or anything like that, could be used in that. I mean, multiple, multiple layers. 
Uh, uh, to to include uh, like embed the glass within uh, yeah. concrete. Um, so that's something that uh, at least I haven't uh, been uh, interacting with any group on before. Um, so I, I know uh, I fiber reinforced uh, different materials have been used. I think that's mainly uh, glass uh, fiber being embedded uh, in, in whatever material is being cured or hardened. Um, I, I haven't, uh, I, I personally haven't interacted really uh, with anybody using sheets of glass, but I think that that might be possible uh, to do. I mean, as far as you know, making it like more lightweight, this material can contain multiple rings or layers of the inside of the structure. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it might, might be. I, I just don't have an experience with it. Okay, yeah. thanks. Well, what about the joint ventures? I mean, that's one thing that I've learned with the Bay Area is that there's a lot of the history of Owens Corning and now Corning is the history of their joint ventures and how to build a market. Is that sort of how you envision this product, this product of the market, or something like the market in South Yeah, uh, so I, I, I really can't, uh, I, I'm just not knowledgeable about uh, like more business aspects or, or kind of business directions, um, whether joint ventures or I, I can't really uh, talk much about, about, about different things. I know uh, Corning is open for a variety of different uh, uh, scenarios. Uh, and then for me, from a, a research perspective, that really means that um, I interact or coming up with ideas uh, about new applications internally within uh, the research center at Corning, uh, but then also working with, uh, and we, we, we generate ideas and, and multiple uh, times those same ideas keep coming up because it's the same group of us talking amongst ourselves. But uh, that's one real reason it's kind of really refreshing to talk with uh, uh, other universities or groups externally because it's new ideas of, of groups uh, seeing um, the glass, uh, the, the properties, uh, kind of capability for the first time, and they kind of they're they're not um, kind of their mind isn't tainted by by thoughts that have already been discussed, but uh, kind of open up. And it can kind of see also the, uh, uh, the the presentations that I had and that Juan had were, were kind of different styles. <laughs> So it kind of highlights also that the, uh, I mean the, the first, when the project kicked off, um, I, I gave similar information to the students, uh, and uh, and then they came up with concepts, and then we had I provided some feedback, or there's some uh, kind of review process, and I think most of my uh, they had they had really basic concepts, and then most of my feedback was was again based on material properties, I and mean, they they had concepts, and and then I pointed out different material properties that might be useful that they could highlight and. Then the next review came along, and and again, maybe they cared, but it, but really, they didn't really incorporate like material properties. All it's still more conceptual, which is and then I kind of got the point, so which is fine. Um, but again, it's a real uh, kind of refreshing to see different uh, the different viewpoints of just coming up with new ideas, uh, and and then kind of using that as a starting point of of really diving into more opportunities. Before I read Daquan, in your students' work, did they um, come up with ideas that the properties that the will of glass doesn't have that they wish it had? So you were offered a material and you were suggested, you know, how, how could this material be used? And the students came up with concepts. Mm -hmm. but then was there any feedback, essentially, to Sean saying, gee, be great. This is if there was another material that could do something else. Yeah, I think, I think that's a really good question. And I think a lot of the comments from Sean was exactly that. For example, the Parshita's project where she was cutting different orientations, that created a like double curvature, which created all these stress. So that actually didn't work. And that was one of the reasons that she went back to this, this very simple opening. And then, for example, in early stages, there were crazy ideas like, uh, can you use it for like uh, store, store, uh, storing like, uh, data on the glass substrate, or could you use it for for uh, photographs or uh, create this, this warp space that creates all, all these kind of things were, were out there. But I think I, I think it was a really good push and pull between okay, students want to do the thing. Sometimes there's a lot of aspects that we actually uh, 
just went forward even if that didn't work that well and then just trying to get that balance between you know, what's well what's not is it worth actually trying to suggest something that is not currently here but but we just suggest that anyway is a vision or is it more like a real project so i think that was a, another interesting topic we always talk about during the, during the discussions right could, could it be used for uh, electrochromatic shade? Yes. So basically, <laughs> that that product, but then it could be responsive. It would have a coating, electrochromatic coating, and it would change its tint. So is that is that a, is that a product that then? Uh, well, I, I think uh, I mean, I, the uh, overall interaction. I, I think Willow Glass was being used as like some conceptual placeholder of, okay, here's here's a class material that, that's then integrated into different uh, uh, concepts. Uh, and then, um, but it's not necessarily optimizing the real will of glass is, is, is a very <coughs> specific composition and forming process, and, but it's not really necessarily optimized for these concepts. So so your earlier question about um, like feedback, I, I, I was very interested in uh, different uh, concepts that they had, how, how the glass, uh, could be improved or optimized to really meet those specific needs. Um, so whether it's larger area or uh, lower temperature for thermal mm -hmm. thermal forming capability. Um, but then other way to, and the next question about uh, kind of electrochromic uh, windows. Um, yeah, there, there might be other materials that Corning has uh, besides will of that. I mean, I, I'm just a representative of that material, but there could be other materials that, that Corning has that um, are, are more suited, suitable for that. Um, so there's there's different interactions kind of pursuing those things. Um, I think at this point they're more based on uh, like rigid sheets, uh, rigid sheets of glass, not necessarily um, highly flexible uh, devices. But I, I think those are possible, but it's just, um, it just needs to be pursued. In fact, it's a question about the, the minimum radius. So you couldn't imagine little glass being used Whatever the diameter of that roller is, of that yeah. shape. I, if it were, well, let's say, a six inch diameter roller, yes, it, it could, be, could be suitable for that. But it depends on really what the requirements are for, for winding it. I'm curious about the environmental friendliness of the glasses compared to plastic or other materials. Uh, in terms of uh, compatibility, or uh, well, or, can it be recycled? Uh, yeah. or, yes, I mean it's it's. Will it last longer? That. Type of thing? Um, I think in terms of I mean, the glass is an uh, inert material that, that's going to resist uh, uh, like reaction with other other materials, so it's it, it, it's resistant to corrosion. Um, it, it could be recycled. Um, I mean, certain percentage of glasses. Um, go and recycle back into the, the products. I mean, just like in glass bottles and things like that, there's, there's recycling options. Yeah, I, I, I know you said you, you don't handle the economics of it, but it just makes you wonder could this replace plastic? Yeah, yeah. Consumer plastic. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, yeah, depending on what the glass objects are, uh, they could be recycled. And, and, and I, 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 uh, I'm just not familiar with, I know displays or electronics are. There's recycling programs for that. I just don't know what, what's involved in those. But, I, but absolutely, the glass could be um, kind of reclaimed and kind of melted again, depending on what, what the needs are. How does the, what is the shape of the thing in this glass thing? Does it shatter? Does it form yes. medium strips? Yes, um, so uh, in terms of mechanical reliability, um, the, the mechanical failure in glass is a brittle material. Um, so like other brittle materials, it'll, it'll fracture. Um, and uh, the fracture will occur along the, the high stress path. Uh, so if, it's, if the glass is being bent around a roller, um, the, the stress is kind of parallel with the roller. So the glass would fracture across the roller, or fracture across the bend. Um, so then to uh, like solutions, appropriate solutions to, to achieve mechanical reliability, uh, are really based on um, knowing that the mechanical failure uh, really depends on uh, the statistical distribution of, of sizes of the defect uh, and then the stress level. 
Um, so that's, those are two two areas that, that can be controlled or, or understood. Um, so really uh, controlling the, the sizes of the, the defects uh, helps achieve mechanical reliability. Um, so that could be done by either um, uh, high, high quality cutting methods, uh, uh, ion exchanging is, is a possible way of, of kind of addressing defects, uh, putting different coatings on the glass like optical fiber uh, has an uh, organic coating on it. Uh, one function is optical, but the other is more mechanical protection. Um, so using different types of coatings to prevent the creation of new defects. Um, but then another thing is related to uh, stresses uh, and, and understanding uh, what's the stress level of glass, either in uh, either in any any manufacturing process, but then also in in the real world uh, where it gets experienced. Where and, and then that brings up the topic too of uh, just mechanical liability really depends more more than just the, the glass response because in the final product um, glass or other elements are going to be laminated or bonded or integrated uh, in and then in some housing or packaging in, into some module or whatever it is it's never so doing mechanical testing on the glass just by itself is, is gives us some understanding of the material response um, but in the actual application, the, there's never going to be a 100 micron thick glass just kind of floating around. It's, it's always going to be it, it, it integrated with something else. And, and then that response of the system it sometimes is uh, surprisingly different than uh, testing the materials by themselves. <clears throat> it's more of a question, answering more in terms of just reliability in general. Yeah, just as a follow up, what is the minimum dimension of the effect? Because at 100 mic micron glass, you ought to have a certain defect dimension below which it is okay, but it's beyond which it may not be okay. Yeah, in, t in terms of yeah, in terms of the uh, uh, mechanical failure and and what size of defects are allowed, it it really really is a combination of uh, stress and defect size. Um, so if the stress is low, uh, it could tolerate uh, large defects. Um, if uh, if the stress level is high, uh, the defect size needs to be very small in order to uh, to, to survive or or, or, or pass uh, that. So if, if glass or like in, in a rigid flat sheet with not a lot of stress on it, uh, it could tolerate larger. And going back to your uh, drinking glasses, for example, I, I know when I uh, wash dishes or something, a lot of things are scratched up, but um, it, but it's not a lot of stress. On, on those objects, but um, so I really, really looking at the the application needs, and then going, and then addressing the problem from uh, a reliability standpoint right from the beginning, and designing reliability uh, into um, the overall elements and the overall system. I think that's that, that that's the path to success. I'm going to go the other way. How thick can you make it and still have it be flexible? Yeah. Uh, so, what, one one answer is the uh, the mechanical. Um, so the stress, the bend stress on the glass is linearly dependent on the thickness. Um, so, for example, if uh, just because it's easy to remember, if the 100 micron thick glass uh, has can, has a bend radius of 100 millimeters and 200 micron thick glass, 200 millimeters is appropriate. Um, so it can. Can, can really start from the standpoint of, okay, what, what's the application, what, what's the application needs, and then based on that kind of design in. Uh, yeah, I'm is, thinking of Daikon's student who took the four intersecting circles and made the different spaces out of it. Right, right. I want some structural strength on the wall. I want yeah. to put Ed's uh, electrochromic on it so I can shield the, the sunlight coming in. I can do a number of different things with it. Mm -hmm. I know Corning typically is a raw material producer. You haven't commercialized this yet. Oh, the, the willow glass is it's commercially available. Okay, yeah. so we're talking about applications you didn't have in mind when the product was created. Right, right. So that's when you need to come up with a company that will buy this because <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to make it. They just want to so supply the raw material. Yeah, they don't want to make the end product. Right. They want to make the roll. Right. <laughs> And it brings up the topic too is okay, it's the will of glass and whatever concept or impression students might have had of okay, this is what their impression of what flexible glass is. And some of these applications might have been completely satisfied with thicker glass. Mm -hmm. 
0.5 angles glass that's typical for liquid crystal displays or OLED displays on large sheets could also be bent to meter radius, two meter two meter radius. And right. if you have a if you have a cubicle, you're not going to have a small radius cubicle. No, no. Right. Um, <laughs> but it's going to be larger radius anyways. So it's, some of these applications could be uh, could be met by thicker sheets of glass. But I think it was useful um, having that as a starting point and the the rule of glass as a starting point just because it, it got them on the thought. Direction. And, and did you guys start out to make this, or did somebody make this flexible glass in the lab and said, "What are we going to do with this?" You know, like 3M and their sticky notes. You know, the glue that wouldn't stick yeah. and turned into a product. Uh, so just you know, maybe a little bit description. So I mean, in thin glass, uh, 100 micron thick glass, 75 or 50 micron thick glass. That that I mean, that's existed for decades. I mean, uh, I mean, microscope cover slips that mm -hmm. you open a box and they're all stuck together. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's roughly like 150 micron thick glass. Uh, so it's those, those and it was never intended for really flexible electronics right. or thin electronics because it was drawn, formed, and then cut into sheets or these little in squares right from the beginning. So it really didn't have a focus of like mechanical reliability. Um, but uh, when when this program started at Corning. Uh, we were very interested in pursuing um, kind of the next generation of uh, 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 electronics, portable electronics, thin, lightweight, conformal. Um, so we, we really approached the topic of, okay, we, we knew that different methods existed of, of making thin glass, like 200 or 100 or thinner glass, um, but let's, let, let's really focus on the reliability and how, how do we make the glass not just get in the right shape, but actually in the right shape with the with mechan showing we can have mechanical reliability. So the, the original focus was more on uh, thin and light, thin and lightweight and conformal electronics at the time. But then it kind of launched into um, a variety of different different sure. things that possible. Sure. I have another question for Jake Juan. So you guided your students through this very interesting process and they came up with ideas and they pursued them. What about you? So uh, now that you've interacted with this material in your work, in your, in your lab, or your practice, you should point out that there's an installation of public art at the intersection of Townsend and um, East Genesee Street that Daquan designed and won in a competition. So uh, if you had wiggle glass, would that have changed? <laughs> would, you, would that have changed that installation, or what are what are? How has this experience mm -hmm. changed your thinking about your own research and your own scholarship? So, so for me, the the matter lab itself. So, so during my study, I really focused on smart material. But as as I moved along, I focused more on okay, I want to use. In you know, architecture scale, you can't really use money because it's just too expensive. So how do I augment the, the existing materials like glass or concrete or in, in terms of geometry and augment the performance? So I've been doing like a series of, of courses or research relating with the particular material. So before glass, I was doing a uh, feature of brick or feature of concrete and the students would investigate that material and then try to create how do I, how do I make this much not chemically because you're not chemists but more in architectural geometric way so this is also a continuation of that like, I know like a lot of the ideas that came up is better material is not optimized but for, for me like thinking of okay what can we do with flexible glass that's sort of superficial but I think it's very very intriguing for design and art with that and, and then obviously you can talk to Sean and then optimize those better, much better but I think that is where I'm trying to go with and, and for me I, I do practice as well so what the research I'm doing is sort of very conceptual as well so trying to bridge that is also quite quite important and I think this type of, of research is set going towards that. I'm curious, I'll, I'll add an ongoing question. <laughs> I was going to ask about how is it actually being used now, since you said 
times of being used. So I'm just curious about some examples. But given that it's flexible, I I don't know how many of you have been to Helsinki in Finland, but um, there's Sibelius Memorial there, and it's made of um, metal tubes. And with the impact of the wind on it, you know, it has different sounds. And I'm just thinking with this flexible glass, what, if it's an outdoor public art application, what about adding sound to the dimension of it being art? And I'm wondering, has that been looked into at all in terms of it being flexible? Because you showed it moving, you know, like a willow tree, there's some sound implied in nature with that movement. So is there some sound with the glass? But back to the practical question too, if you want to throw in, you know, how is it being used now? And, and how does it compare with the, with the competition? Yeah. You know, like in plastic and, yeah. and elsewhere in terms of like heat properties or privacy if you're using it for um, workspaces and pseudo cubicles, you know, since you can have it opaque from one view and maybe clear from the other, you know, how do you maximize space and, and productivity from the workforce? Uh, I, I think so. I, so in the Willow class is uh, being pursued for uh, like interior architecture uh, laminated surfaces. Um, so the, the, like I mentioned, the, the glass could be uh, laminated to uh, different backer materials, uh, metal, uh, wood, um, and then also have some decorative uh, patterning uh, on the back side of the glass. So in that case, it presents uh, to the outside world um, a glass surface that could be uh, clean, um, different types of optical effects, um, but then have patterns that, that simulate uh, wood or, or marble. Uh, and, and then be in a form that could be easily installed, uh, lightweight, uh, can be cut uh, as opposed to like thicker sheets of actual marble or ceramic tile. Um, so that's one application. Uh, another application, like I showed a picture of OLED lighting with OLED works. Um, that, that's another application that, that's also very interesting. Um, and then there's other topics that are more um, kind of be, being explored. Um, that, that, that's a variety of different photovoltaic devices is interesting. Um, uh, types of transparent electronics is interesting. Basically, uh, may, maybe using the glass as a way to manufacture devices in a roll-to-roll -roll process. Um, so utilizing the, the bending uh, in the roll-to-roll -roll process, but then in the actual application, it's, it's then laminated to something flat or, or structural. Um, so that, those are more of the commercial um, in terms of uh, different types of properties of how, let's say, glass compares to uh, polymer film that might be used for, for other types of electronics, um, I think the distinguishing features are uh, the optical properties. I mean, the, op the glass will have a lot more uh, higher optical transmission, uh, colorless, uh, less scattering or haze, um, wider transmission window, depending on what the needs are, uh, higher temperature capability than polymer film. Um, to enable different types of uh, uh, device structures or different materials that could be uh, formed on the glass, uh, be very uh, dimensionally stable. Um, so it won't uh, distort, if you put tension on it, it won't distort uh, either patterns or images on, on the glass. It really enables uh, high registration accuracy of features on the glass to other, other elements. Uh, at hermeticity, uh, so different types of devices like OLED lighting, uh, organic TV, uh, different types of devices really require hermeticity, uh, which the, the glass would also um, kind of excel at, kind of be the be the benchmark for that. So I don't know if that answered. Oh, very helpful. Yeah. Uh, in, in, terms, sound. In, in, oh, terms, yeah, in terms of, uh, no. yeah, so uh, in terms of the the glass using glass is one of the more challenging material for design is because they do want to do something that's transparent or if we call something in class. So there's nothing that we actually did. So that was sort of one of the challenges. And for example, the, the installation project that, that we were talking about is essentially like about 300 stainless steel desks. Mm -hmm. and, this, and, and that's very, very thin. So if you look at it in, in the raining, because it's thin, you, you sort of create this, this beautiful sort of noise to it. And then because of the surface tension, the snow sort of becomes like almost like a sphere on top. It doesn't cover it, it's just like covering it's washing you know, on top. Those kind of things were interesting. But metal, it's, you can see it, it's reflection. Glass, I think, unless we go purely for artistic, when we're overlaying it and 
start to see that visual impacts. And those are, it's, it was very challenging for us to create function as well as creativity together. And Sean, uh, and the comparison of uh, willow glass to plastics, when winding plastics around the core, they often take on a curl, a corset curl. How does willow glass behave? Does it go flat, or do you have to laminate it to make it go flat? Uh, no, the, the glass is uh, uh, elastic. It's an elastic. It'll bend, uh, and then after the stress is relieved, it'll go back to its original shape again. Um, so that it doesn't uh, creep, or uh, at least at the, the temperatures for storage, it, there's not uh, creep or, or plastic deformation. Um, if you look at the, uh, uh, the stress strain curve, it's it's perfect. It's elastic up until the, the failure point. There's no kind of uh, plastic deformation uh, into it. Any other questions? So I want to thank Gary and Sean, otherwise known as Scott, and thank you all.